So welcome everybody to March 2018 uh, edition of EMS Tracks. We've been offline for a while, so it's good to get back online. And it's a really cool day because as you can see on the front of the podium here, this is the first day that we are unveiling our new name of our hospital and our logo. We're now Hennepin Healthcare, but our hospital will remain HCMC. So our speaker today, Chris Calkins, has the uh, dubious distinction of being our first EMS Tracks uh, faculty under our new identity. So it's kind of exciting. Um, just a few things for those of you who are watching online, if you want to participate in the chat, uh, there's a little bit of a delay, but if you go down to the lower right-hand corner to the chat bubble and click on it, you can ask a question, and I will ask uh, Chris that during the course of the lecture. Um, you can also tweet questions with the hashtag EMS Tracks, E-M-S-T-R-A-C-C-S. Uh, you can email them to our EMS Tracks email address as well, um, or you can email us after the fact, and I'll give them, give them to Chris. So Chris is going to uh, give us a little talk today, Be Safe, Not Paranoid, um, and he's a, a colleague of mine at uh, my, my part-time job in the East Metro, and I uh, thoroughly enjoy working with him. And uh, he's the Executive Director of the strub Calkins Center for Suicide Research. He's a Program direct Director Faculty for an EMS program and paramedic uh, out at Woodbury with me. And he's been the EMS coordinator for our municipal public safety department and ops manager for the largest private ambulance service in Minnesota. And he's retired from the fire service after uh, nearly 15 years as a firefighter. He does a lot of work here in the state. He serves as on the Minnesota Suicide Prevention State Plan Goal 3 Subcommittee, the Minnesota Ambulance Association Wellness and Suicide Prevention Committee, the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention Subcommittee on Emergency Responders, which is a federal private partnership the National Alliance on EMS Resiliency, and a, as a peer support facilitator for those who are bereaved by suicide. Chris is a certified as an emergency manager by the State of Minnesota Department of Homeland Security, and as a psychological autopsy investigator and college and university suicide prevention specialist by the American Association of Suicidology. Chris became a suicidologist after the suicide death of his wife in 2003. Chris's resolve has uh, strengthened after the suicide death of his brother and multiple EMS colleagues. A lot of us uh, have been touched by that in particular. And he has experienced firsthand the sting of depression, anxiety, PTSD, and suicidal ideation. Chris has published and presented on suicide and related phenomena on a state, national, and international level. He's been speaking at a lot of our conferences here locally and across the state. And we're very, very fortunate to have Chris as a resource and uh, for him to come in this morning and share his expertise with us. So without further ado, Chris Calkins. Great. Well, thank you, Ross. I'm, I'm honored to be here for the new uh, logo. I'm told I get a mug with the old logo because it's a collector's item. So thank you for that. I'm going to hold you to that, though. Um, so thanks for having me. Uh, and I didn't expect Ross to read the entire bio, but uh, th thank you. I sound really good, don't I? Better than I probably am. Um, so thank you for having me here. Uh, I became a suicidologist 15 years uh, ago today, actually. Uh, it is the 15th anniversary of the death of my wife. Uh, so I think it's fitting that uh, I, I do something uh, to advance um, the cause today. So that's important to me. So uh, she's in my mind uh, a lot today and will be for the next two weeks uh, as she was missing for two weeks before found. Um, so I do want to talk today about be safe, not paranoid. This talk is all about responding to uh, emergency medical calls for people on the suicidality spectrum. So what is suicidality? Suicidality is everything from an ideation uh, to an attempt uh, to a suicide death, which we obviously respond to all those calls as emergency responders on a very uh, regular basis. So that's what this presentation uh, is about. Um, as a longtime paramedic, I've become increasingly concerned as I listen to calls go out um, about uh, the urgency in which EMS may or may not uh, engage in uh, responding to these type of calls. Um, the uh, propensity for staging uh, for quite a while before being cleared into a call. Uh, and I have some very definite thoughts on that. This uh, presentation is really uh, a, a um, follow-up to an article that will be published in the Minnesota Fire Chief uh, magazine this uh, month. It's a bi-monthly publication uh, on this uh, very topic. Um, this expands on that a little bit more. I have that luxury. So um, so you heard it here first, right? So as EMS providers, we have it drilled into our head from a very early stage of our career, uh, starting with our instructors, 
uh, scene safety, right? Gloves on, scene safe. It becomes a mantra. Um, we say it a lot. But what does it really mean, and do we think deeper about that uh, and uh, temper that? Um, scene safety is very important. I want to be clear. I want everybody to be safe. I don't, I don't want to go to uh, a provider's uh, funeral, as I have, unfortunately, too many times. Um, but I, I do believe that we need to uh, temper this a bit. Uh, we know that if we don't do scene safety on the National Registry exam, uh, we would fail a station, right? Everybody is uh, acutely aware of that. Um, so, but, but is that warranted all the time? So if we think about uh, the fire service, the mantra or the saying in the fire service has been risk a little to save a little, risk a lot to save a lot. And those of you who have fire experience under your belts undoubtedly have heard this in, in some form or not. Um, so we do risk our very lives to protect property. Um, a little to protect a little property, a lot to protect a lot of property. And of course, lives are often a part of that too. Um, and there's about 3,200 uh, fire deaths per year in the United States, according to the NFPA, if you're a statistics nerd like I am. So actually, it's more property loss than life loss by a long shot. Um, so we do take those calculated risks. Life is a calculated risk. I sometimes surprise my students when I tell them I don't wear my gloves on every scene. I don't. Uh, and they're mortified by that. I think we have to think a little deeper about life, the universe, and everything to, to rip off Douglas Adams a little bit here. Um, 42 is the answer, by the way. Those of you who know what I'm talking about, if you're a nerd, those who don't, I don't know, you're on your own. Um, but, um, so, I don't wear my gloves all the time. Why not? Do you wear your gloves when you go to a wedding and you shake the groom's hand? Um, no. Why not? You could get a disease. Well, if, I, if my skin's intact and his skin's intact, uh, why would that bother me? Um, if I want to shake somebody's hand today after this presentation, I'm not going to go find a pair of gloves and put them on first. Um, how are they different than somebody I encounter on a 911 call who doesn't have a known disease, cuts, etc.? So we have to think of things in context. Now, I'm not saying Go back and tell your supervisor, I'm not wearing my gloves and all this. Obviously, you have to follow your policies and procedures and all of those things. But I just want you to think about um, this a little deeper and the logistics of it. Um, if we think about how things are changing, we, we also think about our colleagues in law enforcement. Um, They're the ones that go in and stabilize the calls when there's, we believe there's a violent element of some kind. Uh, and then, uh, then we are cleared in. Um, that's changing a little bit with some of the recent um, shooting incidents, and we'll talk about that in some depth here in a bit. Um, but with things like in Minnesota, we do this three echo training. Uh, so uh, now EMS, uh, who has been trained to this level and the agencies have adopted this policy or this procedure, uh, will go in on a shooting incident with law enforcement. Uh, they're covered obviously by law enforcement going in into diamond uh, shape kind of configuration, uh, get to a patient and extricate them. So their EMS is starting to engage uh, in calculated risks. Uh, like I said, life is a calculated risk. So this is a graphic of our Typical, that's me and Ross working in the ambulance there hiding behind the tree. Uh, we've got the call for somebody who's got suicidal ideation and we're waiting for the police officers to go in and tell us that it's okay to come in. Um, now, I'm not saying for a moment, don't use reasonable caution. Obviously, if there's a what report of a weapon there, a firearm, knives, things like that, uh, I'm not advocating that we go rushing in. I'm not advocating that for a moment. I mean, we have to, we have to be safe, obviously. Um, but uh, as I was on duty the other night, uh, probably about two weeks ago, actually, I uh, heard a, a, uh, another agency that's close to, to mine uh, dispatch the ambulance on a uh, young girl uh, who had hung herself. Um, and as I sat there and listened to this call, uh, I heard that the ambulance had to stage and wait for the police to clear them in. Um, I, you know, the typical kind of 
dark humor, bear with me, of EMS, that girl isn't going to come off that rope and attack those providers. She's not. Let's be honest about that, right? I mean, she's not a threat to those people. We know that that girl is on herself. We know that the mother's saying that on the 911 call. What makes that call different than somebody who would maybe accidentally strangle themselves? A while back, there was a, a, a couple of, uh, or a young uh, person that uh, accidentally hung himself at a um, theatrical production. Uh, it was um, deemed that there was uh, horseplay going on and he accidentally did this. Um, how is that different than the other call? Um, so I want you to think about the stigma of mental illness, the stigma of what suicide is. Um, a research project or researchers found that on average nationally, standing by for scene safety delays emergency response or EMS response by 4.5 minutes. Uh, those of you who have practiced EMS longer or as long as me uh, know that that's an average. We probably stand by if we went to median or some other uh, kind of um, accounting, we know that we spend a lot of time on a scene. I've spent 20 minutes, half hour, 45 minutes pretty easily waiting on a scene. Uh, so uh, that's not an uncommon thing. What does the American Heart Association say about this? The American Heart Association says that time of response is definitely tied to success of resuscitating somebody in a cardiac arrest. Many suicide attempts, of course, result in a cardiac arrest, whether it's a hanging, an overdose, etc., etc. Um, so that is something to think about. In fact, if you've taken CPR a couple of times like I have, you know that the American Heart Association will also tell you for every minute delay to defibrillation in a case where a uh, patient could be defibrillated, that the chance of success of resuscitating that patient goes down approximately 10%. That means pretty much game over after 10 minutes, right? 4.5 minutes, 40 and a half percent. That's, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of missed opportunity in my estimation. What makes a 15 year old boy who's overdosed intentionally uh, on narcotics uh, different from uh, a 15 year old boy who was experimenting with drugs and accidentally overdosed? But I'd submit to you that we treat those two different calls very differently in how we respond. Because if we get a hint that there's a suicidal element to it, chances are uh, that we will end up standing by before going into that call. If it's an accident, we won't do that. What makes that different? I think stigma is really the only thing that makes that different. So let's talk about suicide in the United States because there's a lot of myths floating around out there. And if you listen to the media now in the wake of many of the, the shootings, um, you, you hear the call for people who are mentally ill, they shouldn't have guns, uh, they shouldn't have access, et cetera, et cetera. And while I don't disagree that on the extreme end that's true, um, I would tell you that um, that is a myth, that keeping guns from people who have depression or whatever isn't necessarily the solution to prevent murders. It is the solution for preventing suicides. However, we know that means do matter. I'm not really worried about the murders, to be quite honest, and that might be shocking to some people. I mean, I am worried, but I'm not worried, if that makes sense. Uh, I'm more worried about the uptick in suicides that will result. So um, there's 2016 statistics out there, but I'm using 2015 because uh, the CDC says that in 2016, about 45,000 almost suicides in the United States. In the suicidology community, we know that that number is really about two to three times higher than what's reported. Why? Because of intentional misclassifications, accidental misclassifications. Um, what was a death? Was that an accident? Was it not? You need to get inside that person's head, basically, and find out what their intent was. Um, that is, I could do a whole separate presentation on psychological autopsies, and that is the purpose of that, is to kind of figure out what was that intent? What, what was um, the single car accident on the road on a nice sunny day? Almost all of us have been on that call, right? Person hits a tree, no evidence of damage to the car. No evidence of a deer coming out and they swerved. Uh, no evidence of the person had a heart attack and then lost consciousness and hit a tree. 
what was it? Um, that's what we call an equivocal death, an unknown death. Um, but those are often misclassified. Uh, it's not always for bad reasons. Sometimes it's to protect the family from stigma. Um, sometimes it is to help people collect insurance, uh, those kinds of things. When we get to law enforcement misclassification, the research shows that law enforcement officer uh, suicides are misclassified approximately 17% of the time intentionally. It's not always for bad reasons. Firefighters don't have as much clout uh, as police officers, so about 1% of the time firefighter suicides are misclassified. EMS, sorry folks, we get left out again. Um, we don't really know. Um, so we, we kind of get relegated to that side note. We need to look at public safety as a whole. Police, fire, EMS, and I also throw out dispatchers too. Um, we, they're an essential part of our team. Uh, they're every bit responders as, as we are, uh, and I think they suffer a lot of the same psychological traumas, but we, we always forget about them. A little harder to track in data and research, which is probably the barrier uh, to why more hasn't been done on it, but, but we do need to keep them uh, in the front of our minds. Uh, we need to help them too. So um, having said the 2016 uh, statistics, statistics, I'm using 2015 because the other agencies, National Fire Protection Association, et cetera, have not released 2016 data. So it's, it's easier for me to compare. So uh, in 2015, over 44,000 suicides in the United States. Remember that I said that's probably two to three times higher in reality, but we'll just take that uh, on, a, on its face. Uh, and, and believe that there's 44,000 suicides just for the moment. Um, if we look at traffic accidents, according to National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, you can see there about 32,000 deaths per year. That was the reason that EMS was founded, right? 1966, death disability, um, the white paper, uh, that was why we exist today. And I, I think we've done a good job overall with trauma systems and ambulance services and et cetera, and, and we've really brought that number down. Um, less than suicides. Uh, if we look at murders, um, that is, there's about 15,000. So that means that there's one third of the murders that there are suicides. So if somebody who was suicidal was homicidal, that number would be flipped. And remember, I said suicides are probably two to three times higher, right? So that's disproportionate. What does that tell us? That tells us that the, the belief that a suicidal person is going to hurt you is very wrong. That statistically, they're very unlikely to hurt you. Um, but we believe that because somebody perpetrates violence against themselves, that means that they automatically would do it to us. So that's, that is a very misguided belief. 3,200 fire deaths, as I said before. 522 deaths is very interesting to me. That's from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association. That's uh, all the deaths on average per year of hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, hot weather emergencies, cold weather emergencies, uh, lightning strikes, uh, all that stuff on average every year. Um, so think about just for a second, all of the effort that we put into preventing fire deaths, traffic safety deaths, homicides, uh, and severe weather deaths, and how little resources we actually put into suicide prevention. Um, I would also, I just want to throw in the, uh, my opinion on the opioid crisis, since I'm here anyway, and you're my captive audience, I guess you could turn, turn off the computer now, or folks here could walk out of the room, but they're not so far, so that's good. Um, but I do believe that any true op op plan to deal with opioid crisis uh, has to include a suicide prevention element. I would tell you that, uh, well, Several of those deaths are, in fact, people using drugs. They're addicted to drugs. It's an accidental death. Um, that there are a large portion of those deaths that are suicides that are probably hidden from our view. Uh, so I think an opioid, a true plan to address opioid crisis, has to involve suicide prevention. Uh, we just don't know what the extent of that is, but we'd be foolish, I think, not to take that into account. Um, Eisenberg did a study in 2005. Uh, he found that people with a mental illness were exponentially more likely to be the victim of a crime than the perpetrator of a crime. I uh, will also tell you that I did do uh, statistics for an uh, unnamed uh, agency 
um, because I don't have permission to release their data. Um, but what I did was I took um, all of the calls for um, violent that involved violent patients from the ambulance service from from the patient care reports. I ran them against uh, statistically against where that patient was encountered, whether it was a, a home, private home, a healthcare clinic, a mental health clinic. I hate having to say mental health and and physical health, because to me they're basically the same thing, but I have to delineate those for you. Um, Stigma is powerful. Um, I looked at nursing homes. Uh, I looked at all these places. Uh, I looked at whether the person was suffering psychosis or not. I looked at whether the person was intoxicated or under the influence of drugs or not. Uh, I looked at whether the person was hallucinating or not. And my de definition of violence was anybody who um, did, didn't necessarily have to hurt the provider, but they provided some kind of resistance or slapped them or spit them or those kinds of things that would uh, constitute uh, assault legally. Uh, what I found was very interesting, uh, and that is, uh, when I looked at um, sex, male, female too, um, probably not surprising that males are the ones that tend to be more violent than females, so that was the one that really wasn't a surprise to me. Uh, what was a surprise was that statistically, uh, the people who were at nursing homes, mental health or clinics, uh, facilities, were not, actually were, were more likely to not be violent uh, than people found in their own home. So homes are um, statistically the most dangerous place, at least for this one agency. I don't know that I can um, say that that's externally valid and that's true of every service, so you have to take that with a grain of salt. Uh, but in this particular service, I also found that um, those who hallucinate or who um, had psychosis were statistically less likely to be violent. And that was a surprise to me. Those who had a chemical uh, substance use of some sort were statistically less likely to be violent than those who did not. Um, so that those were those were really interesting statistics to me. And think about all the time we worry about uh, the person with the mental illness. I'm not saying don't exercise reasonable caution, but we need to be safe, not paranoid. I mean, that's the whole reason I call this presentation that, right? So I want to talk a little bit about the odds, because so, I am a... So Chris, can I ask a question? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. In your research, were there any groups where you would caution responders to be more suspicious of, of violent behavior and, and exercise what we've traditionally been doing, you know, waiting, waiting for code four before going into a scene? Right. So, uh, and, and I'm assuming that question was recorded because you said it on a, and everybody heard it in the audience because you said it on a microphone. Okay. Um, so, um, no, the, uh, now again, this is one agency and I would invite, invite any agency out there listening who wants to partner and do a similar analysis with their uh, agency to see if it's true for theirs too. I would love to repeat that research uh, and even publish it and, and really get to the meat of that. Uh, so again, you have to take this with a grain of salt because um, the call volume isn't necessarily as high as like say Hennepin counties would be. Um, but no, nothing except for being male and being in your own home. Those are the only two things that I could find. Um, that's it. Uh, so that was amazing to me. I would love to do that on a bigger scale, a bigger service uh, that we could see if it still bore out with larger numbers. I think that's an important question that desperately needs to be answered um, because it could remove a lot of stigma de depending on what we find or it could increase our caution, it could allow us to zero in on certain situations where that caution is warranted um, but for a valid reason, not just because of a gut feeling. I've learned a long time ago that in research sometimes you find things that you didn't think. Um, and you have to keep this objective open mind. I've, I've gone into research and found out, oh, that's not the way I believed at all. Um, but uh, good researchers have to acknowledge that and go with whatever the results are, right? Um, you, can't, you can't bring your biases uh, into that. So did I answer your question? Okay, okay. <laughs> um, so the odds, what are the odds? How many people who su suicide, and I don't say commit suicide, notice that, because I don't believe that su su the word commit denotes a sin or a crime. Suicide is not 
a crime anywhere in the United States except for one place. That is the U.S. Military Uniform Code of Justice. 20 suicides a day of active military and veterans, one of the highest populations. Where attempting suicide is illegal. I don't think that that's working well. To make, they need help. People need help not to be arrested. Not that the military does. I've done some um, psychological autopsies on, on veterans and et cetera, and talked to some of the military people. They're quick to say, well, we don't really enforce that law. But the fact is the law exists. So I think that prevents people from getting help. And I can't tell you how many um, veterans and active military I've talked to that go outside the conventional military system to get help, private pay, or pay out of their own pockets because they don't want the word to get back uh, to the military. So I think that's a big barrier. I think we need to address that. If we could do one thing for military suicides, if I got to pick one, I think the first thing I'd do is make that law defunct. Um, just take it away. See what happens. What do you have to lose, right? If you're not enforcing it anyway, take it off the books. Could remove the stigma. But I digress a little bit. So let's look at the suicides in the United States. Of the 45,000 suicides, there are 2% of those suicides um, where somebody is murdered and then the person who murders them kills themselves. 2% of that almost 45,000 people. Statistically, small number of people. If we go to mass murder suicides, a mass murder kind of defined differently depending on who you talk to. Um, the most common figure used is four, four or more murders and then the person uh, kills themselves. That happens in 0.5% of suicides. Now, I do want to point out that the majority of people uh, who engage in mass murder statistically do kill themselves. That is true. Uh, so I want to acknowledge that right up front. But not everybody does kill themselves. I would say those people are patho uh, psychologically different. The profile is different. Different motivations. Different reasons. Um, so that's an important thing uh, to acknowledge. Um, I once sat in an audience of a, a man who was a nationally recognized uh, EMS expert, not from Minnesota. Um, but he told the audience of over a thousand people um, basically that the next active shooter, the next suicide, the per suicidal person in your ambulance is the next active shooter. This does, so active shooters statistically are more likely to die by suicide. But people who suicide are statistically extremely unlikely to mass murder. So that's not a two-way equation. It doesn't work that way. I approached the man after the conference, introduced myself, and said, you know, I'm worried. I'm worried that everybody who walked out of this conference today was left thinking that that suicidal person in their ambulance is the next murderer or mass murderer. Um, offered to help him, craft his message, of course. No call, no communication. Um, but those are the things that we hold on to, right? EMS loves, loves the drama, loves to say things. Um, so your odds of being the victim of a murder-suicide, 0.001%. You personally, everybody listening to this, that is your statistical odds. Now, does this mean that you shouldn't prepare for being the victim of a murder-suicide or a mass murder-suicide, that you shouldn't prepare for a school shooter or whoever, uh, active shooter of some sort? Of course not. You'd be really stupid if you didn't prepare for that. We prepare for a lot of things that are statistically improbable, and we'd be stupid if we didn't do that. So if you're weather stuff, right? What did I say? Like 500 and something deaths? But we prepare for that, and that's a statistical drop in the bucket. But I'd say you're dumb if you don't prepare for bad weather and injuries, too. So I'm not saying we don't prepare for it. I'm just saying be safe. Don't be paranoid about the whole thing. Um, so in the bottom right-hand corner is a book that um, is very thought-provoking. It's by Thomas Joyner, uh, who is a very noted suicidologist. Uh, and uh, he's proposed a theory. Uh, and I am, I've got a backlog of research, but one of my research projects is to uh, prove or disprove the theory, apply it and try to prove or disprove it. Uh, but what Thomas Joyner says is that suicide, people who die by suicide, are actually, actually have more in common with people um, 
who, or I should spin that around, people who murder suicide have more in common with people who suicide than people who just murder. Prolific serial killers don't suicide, not statistically, right? That's a, again, a different psychopathology. They're not, that's not what it's all about for them. Um, so what does that mean? That means that the person who murder suicides or mass murder suicides is first suicidal and then they're homicidal. So this, what does this mean? This means that a suicide prevention program could theoretically prevent murder suicide, prevent mass murder suicides. But we're so busy lumping all of the mass shooters into one bucket. Right? We, need to st we need to try to figure that out. We need to unwind it. Because if Joyner's right, and I think he is, um, we're looking at these mass shootings backwards. We're looking at them wrong. We're preparing for them wrong. We're doing the wrong things to uh, prevent them. Um, and I, I won't get on my media contagion bandwagon right now, but if, but if you're interested in how the media um, plays a role in uh, contagion, and continuing the cycle of suicides and murder suicides, we can have that conversation at a later a later time. It's uh, a whole fascinating topic all of in itself. But Joyner says that somebody who murders suicides does so for one of four reasons. So first, they're suicidal. The first reason is mercy. Uh, so this is a person uh, who, and, I, and I've seen this in the in the uh, Minnesota databases of deaths. If I look at the suicides, or sorry, the homicides or the murders, murders are different than homicide, uh, and then I look at the, the news reports where the person killed themselves, I see a theme that starts to emerge. Now, I don't have statistics behind it. It's an anecdotal theme. I've just seen it a lot, right? So I don't have the numbers to back it up. Um, but what I've seen is that you look at the person who's been murdered, quite often a white female, uh, elderly, and what do you see in her diagnosis at the end? What do you see in her medical records? Well, what you see are the words metastatic, terminal, end stage. You see those kinds of things. Um, and usually elderly white male who murder suicides. What's that about? First, the male suicidal decides that this is mercy killing. I'm going to kill my wife who's terminally ill and I'm going to kill myself. Um, so that's what a mercy killing is. A number of years ago, we had a woman who uh, sadly um, threw her kids over the high bridge. I believe there was three of them, and then jumped herself. What was that all about? I think it's about if the world is such a crappy place for me, seen through the lens of my mental illness, then it must be for everybody else too. So, while I don't obviously condone that way of thinking, I can understand it. Uh, my own wife, who, who died of suicide 15 years ago, looked at me one day very seriously. She knew I, I, I like to target shoot. She knew I have a firearm. She said, uh, hey, how about a little murder-suicide? She was not kidding. She was serious. What is behind that? She was profoundly depressed. She believed that if the world's such a crappy place for her, then it must be for me too. So that seemed like a completely reasonable request for her to make of me, to me. Um, so I kind of I get that from a first-hand perspective, that way of thinking, and, and Thomas Joyner calls it a perversion of virtue. I'm not wild about the term perversion. I think that carries a lot of other um, things with it, but nonetheless, that's, that's what he calls it. Um, next is glory. So Columbine, we're gonna go out in a blaze of glory, make a name for ourselves. Sometimes, sadly, I think this is what the media um, uh, perpetuates. Uh, I'm suicidal already. And I might as well get some notoriety and some other things while I'm at it. Duty. So I have an obligation for some reason to kill somebody else and then kill myself. Could these be the suicide bombers? Could these be uh, those kinds of folks? Possibly. A thwarted sense of justice or a perversion of justice. This was obvious in things like Virginia Tech. Uh, things where the person... Uh, situations in which a person may have been bullied, felt oppressed, felt discriminated against, uh, felt that they couldn't go for help. German wings flight. If you recall that, the co-pilot locked the pilot out of the cockpit and then flew his entire plane into a mountain, killed hundreds of people. What was the basis of that? 
couldn't get help, couldn't get the level of help that he wanted. I'm making a statement. I'm going to make it right on my way out. I'm not saying it's a reasonable thought. Thomas Joyner also says, the most difficult thing to do, or almost impossible, is to judge a suicidal mind with a non-suicidal mind. You just can't get there. Um, so it's a very difficult thing, because everybody else looks at it and says, ah, oh, it doesn't make any sense. Well, I'm betting your brain's fairly intact, or even if you have a mental illness or depression like I do, we're not that far <laughs> down the road. Um, so I still can't get there. I, so that's, that's the journey. So well, Chris, yeah. so question, this might be a little off topic, but one, how many of these are successful and is there a point where there's a call for help and there's intervention is uh, available? And then if we get involved in that type of call intervention where it's not successful, what do you say to these patients? Right, what do you mean by successful? That the murder-suicide mm -hmm. is they managed to, co to complete what they set out to do. Sure, sure. Um, and I try to avoid successful and complete those um, because language is powerful and, and obviously you wouldn't know that because you're not a suicidologist on the forefront. Um, but somebody who's killed themselves or has had a fatal attempt um, is what I would call it. Um, what do you say to them? Boy, that's very difficult. Um, you know, you empathize. I can see that you're in pain. Um, what else can you do? My other presentation I made you know, a week or so ago, we talked about the benefits possibly of ketamine, 0 0.5 milligrams per kilogram over 40 minutes, relieves suicidal ideation of 50% of the population for up to 10 days. Um, you know, maybe that's an option in the future. I don't know. Um, just empathy, I'm here for you, listening, provide a safe environment. Um, try not to make a judgment because it doesn't matter what you say or really don't say um, at that point. Engage them in an honest conversation. Talk about suicidal ideation. How long have you been feeling this way? Say the word suicide. It's okay. Um, you know, the typical um, standard questions EMS has, do you have a plan? Do you have a means to that? Maybe you know that because they attempted it already. It might be obvious too. Um, I like to give family resources. There, there's a green card I actually carry on duty with me that talks about what is suicide. That I will give family members who've had a, a member who's attempted suicide and say, here's some resources, here's it explains kind of what this is about. But I'm afraid there's not a magic thing, one thing that you can do, right? I don't know if I tie, it's not, it's not a nice neat ribbon tied up for you, but um, that's what I would say. Um, so let's go to more odds. We're gonna talk about things that are a little more uncomfortable. Let's talk about law enforcement officers and suicides. So on average, law enforcement officers are likely to die by their own hand three times as much more likely than some, by somebody they encounter on a call. So that's a staggering statistic. When I did an analysis of the law enforcement officers in the state of Minnesota, they are six times more likely to die by suicide than by homicide. I'm not saying murder. Murder is, diff murder is an intentional, uh, it's a crime, whereas homicide could be, for instance, a vehicular homicide where somebody accidentally gets run down, but yet it's literally a human taking another human's life. Uh, an officer involved shooting um, would be a homicide, not necessarily a murder per se, because it's literally just one person killing another person. Um, so when I look at the homicides, six times more likely to die by their own hand in the state of Minnesota. Murder-suicide is a very uncomfortable topic amongst law enforcement. Sadly, it's more common than you think. There's an entire book written on this. Um, it often accompanies a domestic situation of some kind. Um, it's a very uncomfortable thing to acknowledge, but murder-suicides are higher than we care for in the law enforcement community. When we get to firefighters, Firefighter, a fire department is three times more likely to lose a firefighter by suicide than they are any other line of duty death. So that's quite a staggering statistic. If I look at my Minnesota data, a firefighter is 67 times more likely to die by suicide than by homicide. Look at EMS, nobody's done research on the na national wide sample. 
Um, people don't understand what EMS is. That's part of my mission. Uh, I, I present that to the International Association of Suicide Prevention in, in New Zealand in May, and one of my sessions is um, fire and EMS service for the serious suicidologist. Because if you're gonna study us, you better understand the difference between an EMT and a paramedic. But the suicidology community doesn't, by and large, understand that quite yet, I don't think. So, but then I have the EMS people who want to study suicide and really don't understand suicidology. So I need to bridge that gap. I've got a foot in both worlds. I need to bring those folks together. Uh, and we've done that. We're starting to do that with all these, um, these alliances that I'm, that I'm on. So we don't know an EMS yet, but we, we, we need to find out. If I have anything to do with it, we will. In Minnesota, I did look at it. So single role EMS, 12 times more likely to die by suicide than be a victim of homicide. So that's quite a staggering uh, statistic too. So that's twice the number of law enforcement. Any correlation or reasoning between the fire life? Just in looking at your numbers of uh, firefighters and EMS back. providers, is there any correlation or uh, uh, data, I guess, per se, to explain the difference between firefighters and EMS providers, or could those essentially be lumped together if they're a fire slash EMS service? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm actually, that is part of the thrust of my dissertation that I'm in the process of finishing. Um, so what I've done is taken the death records in Minnesota 2001 to 2016. Um, I've uh, partnered with the Post Board, Peace Officer Standards and Training Board for Law Enforcement, Minnesota Fire Certification Board, uh, and the EMSRB, Emergency Medical Services Regulatory Board. They have matched my death records, all manners, natural accident, suicide, homicide, indeterminate, and pending, uh, to their records. That's how I know who's who. That's how I know who's certified to what level, um, in many cases, what agency they belong to, etc. cetera. Um, so I don't know that question right now, but I'm working on it. And I'm, because I'm also looking at the influence of dual trained people versus single role. So if you've, uh, like a person like yourself, who has fire experience, does that add an extra layer of something on top of it in addition to your EMS duties? Is being a law enforcement officer on top of working for an ambulance service put an extra layer of something? I don't know. So, so you're a very smart question, I'm working on it, is a short answer. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about chemical suicides, detergent suicides, hydrogen sulfide. So this is where the, so the classic scenario is somebody mixes uh, a concoction of household chemicals together. Uh, the scenario usually goes, oh, it's in their car. They put a note on the window, don't open the door. There's poisonous gas, um, et cetera, et cetera, and they die of suicide. So this is the thing that's going around. Has it happened? Yes. Have we upplayed this and made a bigger um, and, and really over dramatized it? Yes, very much so. So where did it all start? It started in Japan. That's where the first chemical suicides were documented. In 2006, 2011, 2,506 chemical suicide deaths in Japan. Um, in Japan, there were 64 secondary exposures. So other people were exposed to the hydrogen sulfide gas 16 of those 64 were emergency responders. Nobody died. Zero. Not one person died secondary exposure. It's important to know. So let's go to the United States. So there were 30 deaths in the United States from 2008 to 2010. That is what the researchers have reported. So keep that number in mind. 30 deaths in the United States. Let's go to Minnesota. January 10th, 2013, Minnesota Joint Analysis Committee, or Senate, rather, put out this warning. So this is just a cut and paste of the actual warning that anybody can find on the, um, it's interesting, it's stamped for official use only, confidential, all that stuff, but this is publicly available. Any citizen can Google it in two seconds flat. So I'm not, I don't really have a compunction about putting it up because anybody can get it. So. Uh, if, if, my, uh, if a 10-year-old can get it, I can put it up here, is my opinion. Um, so, 
situational awareness, chemical suicide, first responder safety information. Um, so put out on January 10th, the day before there was a legitimate chemical suicide in Minnesota. This is what I would call an error of recency. Something happened, let's do something about it, let's put out a warning. Okay, but then I think embellishments happen. So what we say here, what they said was 10 instances of chemical suicide reported in the last 18 months with two reported in the last two months. Um, so that's what it says. So what's the truth? So I went through the death records because I have them. <laughs> and I looked from 2001 to 2016 for Minnesota, only four. Because you can't tell me that there were 33% of the entire chemical suicides reported instances were in Minnesota. 33% of the entire nations. I get really concerned about this because these are the people that we look to for guidance uh, to advise us and give us um, intelligence information about what's going on. And so, granted, there may be something I'm not privy to or something I don't know. Um, maybe they're counting carbon monoxide deaths as gas deaths. I don't know, because that would hit their threshold. They should probably say that if that's the case. Um, so, really interesting stuff. So, what does this mean for us? Um, recently, I, I had the, the honor of presenting uh, at the uh, Time Critical Conference up in Fergus Falls, their EMS conference, uh, and uh, I watched uh, Kirk Hughes, who's the, the uh, director of the Poison Control Center, do a presentation, and I was lucky enough to have a conversation with him afterwards. Um, as I had chemical suicides were very much on my mind, I'd been researching it. Uh, so I asked him what he thought about it, um, would he be interested in co-authoring some article on it, he indicated he, he would, and I hope if he's listening he still is, I'll be approaching him soon. Um, he advised me that, you know, those aren't as dangerous as people think. Um, that he has research that indicates that once the window is broken or the glass, that the chemical really dissipates quite fast. So theoretically, if you were upwind and you broke a window out and backed off, the contents would evacuate really quickly. Why the note? Well, perhaps the suicidal person wants you to pause, doesn't want you to open the door or the window. So it delays the time to rescue. I'm sure there's probably cases too where there's a note, but there really isn't anything in there. Maybe it's an overdose or something like that. Um, maybe those are counted in the Minjack numbers. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe attempts where the person did not die are included in those numbers. Although it does say in the, in the uh, uh, report that they were deaths. I, I can't know. Um, but that's really concerning to me um, that we think this is a much bigger problem and much more dangerous. So I wanna emphasize again, zero responder fatalities. It's up to everybody what, how they wanna to respond to a call. Um, have I ever gone to a call where I didn't wait for police clearance? You bet I have. Minnesota thing to say for those people who are outside of Minnesota, we like to say you bet. So you bet I have, or you betcha. Um, I made a judgment call. I think we do that to a large extent a lot. Uh, had a young man who, who had shot himself quite a number of years back. Family's distraught. Um, we're right down the street. We're all over the call. I mean, like two blocks away. Um, just in the right place at the right time, I guess. Um, families outside, we can even see them. Um, they're waving us down. To Imagine if we were to go down the street and say, we gotta wait for police to call us in, right? I mean, they're basically running towards us the park. When I was a manager uh, for a large ambulance service, I actually had a crew do that, uh, where there was a call for somebody um, who was unresponsive um, due to as a pregnant person um, and the person was concerned there was a mental illness element and they parked three blocks down and waited for police to come in the family came up to the side window knocked on it and said hey she's over here they said we have to wait for scene safety we can't go in until the scene's clear let's think about this deeper could it be that 
the person unconscious is going to hurt them? I doubt it. Who would the scene safety be for? Probably the people knocking on your window. It's too late now. If you're really that concerned, you should have parked across the street, someplace where you weren't seen, et cetera, et cetera. It's interesting, the person filed a union grievance on me. I never disciplined the person. All I told them was, you should think about doing that. So apparently, to grieve something, you actually need to have suffered some kind of ill consequence other than a supervisor saying, um, I don't think that was a good move. <laughs> um, but I, think that's, I don't think that's an isolated insulin incident. I think that happens a lot. Where's common sense in all this? And how are we responding uh, to these calls? And why are they different when it's a 16-year-old who's overdosed intentionally versus not intentionally? Again, I'm not saying that if there's weapons in there or you suspect there's knives, guns, things like that, that you shouldn't go in or, or violent people, that you have those hints. Um, I'm not saying we should not stand by, on every, uh, but, I, but I, I think we shouldn't stand by on every call. Uh, and then sometimes we go lights and sirens to a call, hurry up and wait game. Did this just last week at my own service. Person who had attempted, or I didn't attempt suicide, they were suicidal went lights and sirens to the call, parked around the corner, waited for 45 minutes, uh, and then was canceled anyway. What if I'd taken a family of five out on that response to that call? Uh, so there's the other side of that too. We just need to be more reasonable about these types of things. Uh, of course, in every presentation, um, what I say must be supported by research, or it isn't worth the paper that it's written on, or the elect electrons that it's written on, I guess. Um, so I do have uh, plenty of references. Um, happy to provide them to anybody. Of course, there's things inevitably that come up that I didn't think I was going to say that I can support with references. If you're curious or, or need that information, maybe you're working on a project, a paper, or whatever, feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to help you with that. That's part of the mission of our nonprofit. Um, this is our nonprofit's uh, URL, our, so visit us. Visit us on Facebook. We also have a LinkedIn presence too. I didn't get it up here in time. Um, but likes on Facebook help us to disseminate information and, and get things out. Email me, call me if you need anything. And we need to save some lives. We gotta save some lives. Uh, I'm tired of going to funerals with people I love, um, people I've worked with. I'll we'll have to do something about this. I think EMS can take a dent out of suicide prevention. I'm looking for the right service. Uh, who says, I want to decrease my suicide rates in my service area by 50% because I think we can do that. I think EMS can do that. I just need, um, I need the opportunity. So uh, whatever I can do for you, whether it's research, whatever, reach out, please. Um, I guess I would, we have seven minutes left. Uh, do we want to do follow-up? questions. I could. I have other things I could talk about very easily. I could go down the uh, media. I saved the shiny media thing for uh, for the end if, if you really want to talk about that, but otherwise I'll open up the questions. What about um, allowing paramedics to place patients on transportation holds? You know, we always have to wait for law enforcement. Where do you think it could get to the point where we can do it? The legalities of it. Well, it, whether we should be allowed to? Uh, that's interesting because somebody a actually um, asked me for my opinion on that about two years back um, because um, it was actually Alina's a, a um, governmental affairs uh, person asked me about my opinion on that. Should, like, should we advocate for that or not? I wasn't sure, I guess, about uh, transport holds. On one hand, I think it would be convenient, expeditious maybe help decrease scene time a little bit and get people to the help that they need a little quicker. So I can definitely buy into that uh, argument. But on the other hand, you are depriving somebody of their liberty, right? I mean, in, a, in a fact, you are. You're depriving them of their civil rights and you're taking them to the hospital. Um, I just have to be brutally honest about my own profession and what I said to um, Bill, who asked me, was, um, you know, I think it could be a good tool, but I do think there's an element out there who would slap somebody on a hold just as soon as think about it. And we all know people like that, probably, sadly. So, so I don't know that I'm for or against it, but that's my thought process, and I kind of worry about that a little bit. 
But I'd also go a step further and say, should we be transporting people in whole period? I did some research in Italy. Uh, so I went there, interviewed several mental health professionals, toured ambulance services, uh, talked to international suicide prevention um, expert uh, who I still correspond with, and uh, found some interesting things. In Italy, Italy spends 8% of its gross domestic product on healthcare. United States spends double that, 16% of its gross domestic product on healthcare. Italy has less social workers, less psychologists, about this probably a similar number of psychiatrists to have to go look at that. What's the difference? Their suicide rates are declining. Ours are, and, and uh, are lower than ours. Ours are obviously higher and have been going up for almost 100 years. What's the difference? What's going on? They outlawed all mental hospitals in 1978. They're against the law. Um, there's only like four centers that are community-based now for people who are violent um, with very low patient census. To get on a hold in Italy takes two physicians to agree that you should be placed on a hold and forcibly taken to the hospital. Then after that, you have to get the approval of the mayor of the city. It doesn't matter if it's a big city or a little city. Think Rome. You have to get the approval of the mayor. But that's not where it stops. Then you have to go before a judge, and the judge has to agree with the mayor. So what happens? Hardly anybody gets transported anywhere, right? But their healthcare system's different too. They have physicians, nurses that come into their homes. There's something called a right to the community. Uh, they really, Italians have really internalized the right to the community. And to get you well, one of the first things that happens is all of your rights your ability to participate in the community are restored as quickly as possible and you're treated at home. It's working. It is working. And if we look at um, what happens when Italians or other folks that ha are similar culturally, and by that I mean um, very close family-wise, um, like the Latino, Latina population, for example, um, who have a very strong sense of family, come to the United States, those people um, have lower suicide rates than us until they acculturate. <laughs> Double income families, don't eat dinner together, etc. Things go downhill from there and sadly they catch up to our rates. So that's probably a lot more than you asked for. Um, but the bigger question is, is a hold even really an appropriate thing? And what are we doing? Right now, you know as well as I do, that there's ambulance services taking people from the Twin Cities to very remote parts of Minnesota or North Dakota or where. We know that this is happening right now at this very moment. Tons of them, right? Because there's not the beds available. Suicide prevention, if you, could, if you had to pick only one thing, I'd say social connection, work on that. We're taking people away from their support. They wanted to take my wife who was suicidal from the Twin Cities in a hospital where I could visit her every day on my breaks uh, at work. And they wanted to take her up to Duluth so a couple hours away. That severs all our social ties. I mean, it's arguably one of the biggest suicide prevention things. I, I asked the hospital, are you trying to pound another nail in her coffin? There was a service, uh, a mental health service uh, that is part of a committee that I'm on that uh, their claim to fame was, well, we've put like X 100,000 miles on our cars this year, transporting people all over the state. And I said, that's not something to be proud of. That's a symptom of something really bad. You should be like hardly any miles on your car should because you should be keeping them close to home where their support systems are. So I could go. That's my diatribe. It's a good question though. I mean, so the the answer is I don't know what I think about it. I guess. So Chris, um, I'm glad you mentioned the the family thing. That's kind of what I was thinking when you were talking about the the Italy cases and some of the research that I've done in, in my past on uh, traditional indigenous medicine in Latin America, same thing. It takes the community to heal a person. If they're sick, the entire community is sick until they are better. Um, when you're talking about an EMS agency to partner with you to do something about suicide rates in their jurisdiction, what is, is there anybody in the nation who is doing this? And are they doing it right? Um, or what are the 
things to focus on besides keeping these patients in the community and supporting them. I have I have found I don't know what happened. Maybe maybe that was I hope that wasn't me. Um, I have found no evidence of. Uh, maybe there's an ambulance service out there that exists somewhere that's doing something, uh, but nothing that, no service that's doing anything comprehensive that I'm aware of. So inevitably I'll get a, a tweet from somebody saying, we're doing something. Okay, but I didn't know about you, sorry. Um, but none that I know of. We need a comprehensive plan. There was a, a major research project done uh, in a hospital-based um, system, or in a hospital, this wasn't EMS. Um, but what they did is people who were suicidal, had a suicidal ideation or had a suicide attempts and were hospitalized, upon their discharge, they were given a, a card in the mail, sent a card. The card said, we value you. You're an important member of our community. We care about you. We hope you're doing well. Here's some numbers. That simple act, the cost of the postage and the card reduced readmissions to those patients by 50%. That's one card and postage. Imagine if we did that for every patient we transported who had suicidal ideation or an attempt. Imagine if we handled the family well um, and just better. Um, people who are left over after a suicide like me are exponentially more likely to die by suicide ourselves. Co-workers have lost somebody due to suicide depending on their closeness of the relationship are exponentially more likely to die of suicide than somebody else. So from a managerial perspective, if it's a suicide in your agency, how you respond to that afterwards could help prevent the next suicide in your ranks or somebody else's ranks. We're a tight-knit community. Um, you know, just because it was a Hennepin County paramedic and, and I don't work here doesn't mean I didn't know them, wasn't friends with them, right? Um, that still impacts me very heavily. Um, but the general public, how we take care of that, those families, the resources we give them. So we have intervention or pre prevention, which we could argue all day long that I don't think EMS does as good a job as it could. Um, we have the intervention, which is probably what we're the best at, right? Something happens, let's get shiny lights there and let's do something. And then this postvention piece. And what people need to internalize is postvention is prevention. And I have lots more ideas. Those are just two, and I know we're up against the time crunch, so I want to be respectful of that. Thank you. Um, we didn't get any questions from online, but I, I want to sincerely thank you for sharing your experience, your expertise, and spreading this uh, very, very important message, and look forward to having you back again. Yeah, thanks. Thanks.